Well, thank you for joining us here. Uh, this week we're going to be discussing finance. Over the course of the next hour or so, I'll provide you with an introduction to finance. We'll go over what finance is, a very important function in business. Uh, we'll discuss some of the different ratios that financial managers and investors utilize in order to assess the strengths and weaknesses of their particular company. Uh, we'll go over different funding options, uh, capital structures, also managing cash, cash equivalents, as well as inventories and accounts receivable. And then lastly, we'll end with the discussion of capital budgeting, as well as the time value of money, future, as well as present values. So first off, what is finance? Uh, finance is the area of business that's responsible for finding the best source of funds and the best way to use them. There are a number of different alternatives that exist where companies need to decide what is the best one of those alternatives. It requires not only prioritizing what are the interests of the actual company, but also finding out once we receive those funds, whatever, whatever source they come from, how are we going to utilize those in a way that is responsible, or I should say fiscally responsible, especially when you take into consideration the interests of our shareholders. Uh, we all know that uh, management is responsible for acting in the best interest of the shareholders representing their interests and also handling the money that they were given in a fiscally responsible manner and so finance is concerned with not all finding not only finding the best source of funds whether it's a bank loan whether it's issuing additional shares to investors in exchange for purchasing those so they can use those sources of funds but also finding out once we have that money what are we going to use or what are we going to put it towards how can we use it in the best way shape or form and this is extremely important because if finances aren't utilized correctly or in a responsible manner what that does is that affects investor confidence if I as an investor choose to put my money into a particular company in exchange for stock or ownership of that company then I want to make sure that the money I'm giving them is going towards a good cause and is being used in a responsible manner. If it's not, then I'm probably less likely to continue to invest my hard-earned dollars into that particular company. Now one of the things that companies need, of course, is financial capital. Uh, financial capital means essentially just money or dollars, obviously here in the U.S. And these are the funds that a business uses to acquire different assets and to finance its operations. And so what are some examples of assets? What are some examples of things that companies would need to finance? Well, the first of which is payroll obligations. Companies obviously need to meet payroll obligations by paying employees for the hours that they've worked. Labor in many businesses is the greatest expense. And so you need to have the capital necessary to meet those obligations. You need to know if you're going to have cash available to actually pay them in a timely manner, of course. The next, you need financial capital to repay debts. Many companies take out loans with different institutions, different commercial banks, and those obviously ha require a series of payments, usually on a monthly basis. In addition to that, you usually pay interest, just as you, uh, you or I would, on a consumer-type loan. And so ca financial capital needs to be available specifically to repay those debts and also compensate those particular banks for for interest as well for the time that they did not have those funds readily available. Next, paying taxes. Uh, companies do pay taxes as well and so they do need to have the financial capital or the cash available to pay those. It's not enough to have the promise of cash at some point in time and we'll get into accounts receivable and how that plays a factor but you need to have the cash on hand to go ahead and make those payments especially in a timely manner to make sure that you're compliant with any type of federal uh, and state laws. And lastly we deal with purchasing equipment and capital you need to be able to have the cash on hand to purchase property. And this doesn't imply solely just cash, but access to bank loans, access to different funding sources, in an attempt to actually make different types of capital expenditures. Things like building brand new stadiums, like Texas Stadium shown in this photo here, which costs roughly $1 billion to actually create and to, to fund this particular project. You need capital to purchase equipment if you're in a, a type of business that utilizes equipment to a very extensive degree. Uh, and there are a number of different sources or different reasons why you would need to have some type of funding as a way of providing equipment, plants, 
uh, land, obviously, if you're going to build things on, those all play a factor in how finance helps businesses not only seek the funds that they need, but also use those in a proper manner. Now, what is the goal of financial management? Uh, the purpose of financial management really, and I alluded to this before, is to maximize the value of the uh, firm to its owners, to essentially be fiscally responsible with the finances that were provided. Uh, as we know, the owners of publicly traded companies are actually shareholders. And so the responsibility, or at least the goal here for financial management, is to make sure that the interests of the owners, which are the shareholders with regards to publicly traded companies, that the interests are represented well and the money that's provided from them is used in a responsible manner. But also, not simply just being responsible, but also maximizing the return on investment. Remember that people that are shareholders, they're considered owners of publicly traded companies, the reason that they invest their money is because of the potential for to receive more money at some point in time in the future. So it's the responsibility of management to make sure that that actually takes place. Now, you may argue that there are certainly things that are outside of the control of management, economic conditions being one, global conditions being another. And those obviously can't necessarily be predicted. We have to almost adjust to when those things do take place, when those events do occur. But there are things that are under management control that they have the ability to affect. And those are the things that we as investors want to make sure that management and the board is representing our interests well and making decisions that aren't necessarily just going to increase the stock price for a short period of time, but are going to position the company long term so that it can compete more effectively in the market and that it is lined up to be more successful over an extended period of time and not just reaping some type of short term benefit. One of the things that always comes into conflict is this idea of increasing shareholder value, providing value for the owners of the company versus being socially responsible. And the reason these come into conflict is you talk about the stakeholder model of responsibility, which we did several weeks ago. Now, the idea of being socially responsible, you consider several different groups. You consider investors, you consider employees, you consider the community, you consider the environment, uh, and you consider uh, several other groups. But the problem is, is that when you're maximizing the value for shareholders, you're typically doing so to the detriment of another group. And so, for example, shareholders obviously want to maintain low expenses because the lower costs are for a company that can provide more profit for them in terms of uh, paying dividends or reinvesting into the company and hopefully generating some share price appreciation, which all that means is that the share price is going up. Uh, so that's their desire. However, if you're an employee, you know you want to make sure that you're earning a fair wage. You want to make sure that you're having some type of fair benefits. You're being compensated for your time well. That possibly you're able to maintain a pretty decent work-life balance. You're not working 80 hours a week, so you can eventually go home, spend time with your family, obviously recharge, and then go back to work. But sometimes those values are in conflict with one another. And so companies need to have kind of a balancing act here uh, because what we see is that generally companies that are socially responsible in the long run tend to provide greater shareholder value because you have employees that stay with you longer because they're being paid well, they're being treated well, and so they're not necessarily looking for other employment. They're not necessarily lowering their performance on the job to compensate for not getting that raise, which we'll talk about with regards to equity theory uh, several weeks from now. And so we're seeing that result take place. The problem, though, is that it's more long term. Uh, from a short term standpoint, if you wanted to maximize your uh, profits the quickest, the easiest thing to do is to cut labor costs because that is a direct impact on what your expenses are. The problem is, though, in the long term, it's not beneficial because typically you're losing people that have experience. You have to train new staff. There's kind of a reacclimation period almost, and now you have maybe a uh, younger, less tenured, seasoned uh, staff on board, and there can be some problems that generated from that, much as we've seen from the NFL and hiring replacement referees. And so, you know, obviously this was a cost standpoint. 
NFL wanted to reduce its costs as quickly as possible, so obviously did not agree to a long-term deal with the NFL uh, Referees Association, and so relied on replacement refs who have less experience. They don't have comparable experience. Typically, they've refereed on a very small scale, uh, some in you know, uh, not even uh, you know, legitimate leagues, if you will. And, and we've seen the result of that. We've seen the missed calls. We've seen the longer delays in terms of actually being able to deliberate over a call and that has an effect and that's really the trade-off that organizations have is maybe in the long run I'm lowering my expenses or in the short term I'm lowering my expenses but in the long run am I hurting my company's brand am I hurting the image am I hurting the trust that the consumer has with us in our particular company it's a very realistic conversation very thing that's very real next you have to deal with rewards uh, corporate officers like your CEO typically aren't paid a great deal in an annual salary. And, and the reason that's not done is you want to tie the interests of the CEO to the performance of the company. So you want them to make decisions that benefit the company so that they actually do better once the stock price of the company actually goes up. The problem with this particular model is the intent is good but there's a fundamental problem here is that a lot of the rewards are tied to short-term performance and so decisions can be made that initially may increase the stock price significantly but don't provide a great deal of long-term value okay uh, things that temporarily reduce uh, expenses so that your earnings uh, your earnings are higher temporarily for one particular quarter and that boosts the stock price temporarily that's good but you have to think long term are we putting ourselves in a position to where we're actually going to have difficulty competing with other companies because now we have a less tenured less experienced workforce we got rid of our most expensive employees which typically have the most experience have the most knowledge have the most significant abilities not always but generally speaking and so you do have to once again consider are we compensating our corporate officers in a way that encourages them to make short-term decisions that benefit the stock for a very very short period of time but not necessarily lining up the stock or the company for long-term success Well, when you're evaluating any particular investment uh, you always consider the relationship between risk and as well as return and there's a trade-off that exists with regards to risk and return uh, so when we refer to risk what we're referring to is the degree of uncertainty about a decision uh, translated directly to investments you're looking at the degree of uncertainty that you have that that particular company their share price is going to appreciate or increase in value you're also taking a look at the degree of uncertainty over whether that company can be sustainable and can be successful long term if there's a concern over whether or not the company is going to be able to make any money that means there's a higher degree of risk associated with that particular company and as a result we as investors will want to be compensated for the risk that we incur for example the savings account uh, that you have pays a very very low rate uh, typically we're a quarter of a percent to maybe a half a percent since the Federal Reserve is trying to keep interest rates very very low to help stimulate the economy encouraging people to take loans and then obviously reinvest that money back into the economy so for the time being interest rates are very very low which doesn't help people that are saving and have money in savings accounts obviously uh, but because that is a very very safe investment the money in your savings account is insured with the FDIC or the NCUA it's insured for a certain dollar amount so that in the event that that financial institution cannot continue to meet the demands of deposits and cannot uh, compensate people for withdrawals then the FDIC will essentially step in and will insure the deposits so up to a certain amount uh, as of right now it's two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars but it typically is a one hundred one hundred thousand dollars they temporarily just increase that uh, as a result of the economic recession of 2008 uh, but as a result my investments very very safe even if the financial institution crumbles I'm still guaranteed to get my money and so because it's a safe investment because we're not incurring a great deal of risk the savings rate what we're compensated for is not very great which is why you see very very low rates compare that to maybe the 
uh, interest rate or the yield on a Spanish bond, which is a government IOU by the Spanish government. Spain, as we know, is in a, a great deal of fiscal trouble. Uh, they are going to the Eurozone as a way of uh, getting funding to meet its demands or meet the demands of creditors to continue to pay off its debt. They have a very high debt to GDP ratio. And as a result, there's a great concern over whether the Spanish government can continue to operate if it's going to essentially become insolvent. And essentially meaning that it will not be able to meet the demands of its creditors and repay people for the money that it's received. And as a result of that uh, inherent risk, investors want to be compensated more for, in, for buying a Spanish bond. And typically, we're dealing with anywhere from 6 to potentially as high as 7% at some periods of time, which is not sustainable for every government to pay 6 to 7% on its debts. Uh, it just continues to increase and increase your national debt. Uh, which limits your ability to pay for other things, of course. Contrast that to the yield on a U.S. Treasury bond, which is in the 1.5% to 1.6% range. It's considered to be a very uh, safe investment. It often is considered to be a risk-free investment, meaning there is no risk whatsoever. So at the very minimum, I know I'm getting this. There is no... There's no chance that the U.S. government will fail at any point in time, and that's the rationale. And so you have to compare not only the risk of an investment, but also the return. And that's what you expect to receive in exchange for incurring your risk. The more risk that you incur, the greater return you should be provided. Uh, likewise, the greater return that you're provided, you also have to consider that means that I'm incurring more risk. If an investment pays more, if I get more in return, then the inherent underlying assumption is that I'm also incurring a great deal of risk as a result of that investment. Well, one of the things that managers and investors really also use is what we call ratio analysis. And the reason that this is used is we want to be able to compare different values, uh, not only with past historical documents that are internal to the company, so past financial statements, financial records. But we also want to be able to compare those to different competitors in our industry to see ultimately how we're faring. And this is something that's used not only by management, but it's also used by investors as a way of determining whether or not a company would be a sound investment. Uh, so what we're trying to look at here is identify what are some of the strengths of the company, uh, but also some, what are some of the weaknesses. And as I said before, this is done on an internal and an external basis because as investors, we want to know these things before we place our hard-earned dollars into a particular company and decide to invest. But also internally, managers want to know these things so they know where to focus on. Where can we make improvements so that ultimately we are a more attractive investment? Ultimately, we are providing greater shareholder value for our owners as well. And now ratios compare values from some key accounts from the various financial statements. They look uh, everything from your balance sheet to an income statement to a statement of cash flows to a statement of retained earnings and, and others as well, less common statements. They look at those particular statements because when you're looking at the numbers, you really have a difficult time comparing different things. Now, you're not necessarily comparing apples to apples because one, some companies aren't in your same industry, but you're looking just at a bunch of data. And so how do you make sense of everything? Well, financial ratios are one of the things that you can use to provide more meaning to what it is that you're looking at, to give you a quick snapshot of some of the different uh, statistics about a particular company. If you were to utilize a service like Google Finance or Yahoo Finance or even the same equivalent provided by E-Trade, if you look up any type of stock, you find their ticker symbol, look up the stock, and usually the first thing that comes up when you key in that ticker symbol for that particular company is a general overview which includes some key statistics in terms of how the company handles its finances. And obviously you can get to a location to where you can find additional information but it's just designed to give you a brief snapshot so you can look at those and then make some general inferences based upon what you're looking at. 
So let's look at some of the different financial ratios. Uh, I'm going to go over the different categories of financial ratios and then I will highlight a few specific ratios. I don't necessarily want to go into each of them in great detail, uh, but I will highlight some of the more significant ones or some of the more common ones that you'll come across, I should say. So the first type of ratio that we have is what's called a liquidity ratio. A liquidity essentially is cash. Uh, when I refer to something as being more liquid, that means that I, it either, I, either is cash in itself or it can be converted to cash fairly quickly. And in business, cash really is king. Uh, cash allows you to do certain things. If you have a promise to pay, it is not the same thing as if you had cash in hand already because you can't spend it until you have it. And so liquidity ratios address this issue, trying to answer the question, does this company have enough cash on hand to meet its liabilities? Okay. Uh, more specifically, we're looking a lot of times at current liabilities, uh, which as we know from accounting, Current liabilities are liabilities that are due in less than one year. So typically incorporates wages payable, so money we owe to employees. Also includes uh, notes payable, which are in particular loans and different things that we have to continue to pay on or that are becoming due in a certain period of time. Uh, and can also be accounts payable. So if we do business with a particular company, and we purchase something on credit and that's not due for six months, that would be categorized as a accounts payable. At some point in time, we are going to have to pay that and we need to calculate that or at least account for that as an expense so that we know we need to set some money aside to address that particular expense. The next type of ratio that we look at are what are known as asset management ratios. And very simply, all asset management ratios are looking at is how effectively is this business using its assets to generate income? Uh, asset management ratios usually address the, the outcome in a percentage format. And so it determines ultimately what percentage of income is generated from those particular assets. And this is very, very helpful for investors because we understand ultimately how efficiently and how effectively a company is utilizing some of the different assets it has. Things like its equipment, things like land, and all those other different types of assets, how good is it at using those particular things? And obviously we want to invest in companies that utilize their assets in a more favorable way. The next type of ratio we look at are leverage ratios. Uh, leverage is simply a fancy word for saying debt. Uh, we're looking at how well a firm uses its debt. Uh, and so typically, most companies usually have some type of loan outstanding, uh, although not all do, but a majority of them do use leverage in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and then what we're really trying to look at here is how well, how effective are they in utilizing that particular leverage or debt, so to speak. And the last ratios that we look at are what are known as profitability ratios. Uh, profitability ratios just measure how successful a business is at earning profits. Uh, so very, very simple. Uh, once again, this can be addressed in a percentage format because you're comparing it to existing resources. But just very, very simply, we're just trying to see at how successful a business is at earning profits. So here are a few different types of financial ratios. As I said before, I'm only going to go into a few of these uh, because I really want to keep this to uh, more of a general type discussion. I don't want to go into too specific detail because these are really ratios that you would deal with once you take specific courses related to finance and financial management. Uh, I consider them to be outside of the scope of this course. What I really want is for you to know the general categories of the ratios and a few of the more common ones but I don't necessarily need you to know the average collection period or inventory turnover ratios, although they are helpful. And we're not going to get into those necessarily for this particular course. Uh, so let's go over a few of them. Uh, first off, we have a current ratio. Uh, current ratio is a type of liquidity ratio, so we're dealing with the company's ability to repay its short-term liabilities. And the way that you utilize a current ratio is you take your current assets and you divide them by your current liabilities. And so what this tells you is does the company have enough assets on hand, so current assets which include 
cash, accounts receivable, also includes inventory. Do we have enough of those items on hand to cover the liabilities that are going to be due in a year or less? Typically, although it depends on the industry that the company operates in, but usually you want to see a current ratio anywhere from two to three. And that means that you have twice or three times as many assets as you do liabilities, which makes it more likely that you would be able to repay those. Uh, investors obviously want to see that because they want to make sure that a company is going to have the assets on hand to take care of those particular things. Now the problem though with this particular ratio is it makes a very big assumption. And that assumption, you may have picked up on it, is that maybe a company will not be able to convert its inventory into cash. Is that always realistic for it to be able to convert everything in its inventory into cash for the purpose of paying its short-term liabilities? And the answer is no. If you take a conservative approach, you, know, you have to think that you're probably not going to be able to convert all of your inventories into cash. It's simply just not possible. For one, the inventory may be obsolete, so maybe nobody wants it. Inventory, of course, becomes damaged when people move it around. Uh, suddenly, magically, it just grows legs and begins to walk away, mysteriously enough. And so to think that we would be able to convert all of the inventories into cash is a very big assumption and one that could get into a lot of problems, particularly if a company holds a great deal of inventory. That is making a huge assumption. So one of the things that you can do instead of utilizing the current ratio is to utilize what we refer to as the quick ratio. And you'll notice from the equation it's almost identical. The only exception is that it factors out inventory so that we have a more conservative figure to work with and we can tell whether or not we have enough cash and accounts receivable on hand to pay for our current liabilities. If we have inventory that we can convert to cash or end up being able to, then that's obviously very beneficial. But we don't want to rely on that, uh, particularly if you get into companies that are like retailers that rely heavily on selling different goods. If we have a great deal of inventory, uh, we don't want to bank on being able to convert all of that to cash because that's going to give us a false sense of security almost. And so as an investor as well, you would want to make sure that that company has enough current assets, less inventory on hand to meet its, its liabilities that will be due in a year or less. Usually with a quick ratio, although it depends on the industry, once again, you are going to want to see at least a, a quick ratio, I should say, as of one. Uh, meaning that we have enough cash and accounts receivable on hand to actually meet our short-term liabilities. If we can convert inventory, that's great, but once again, we shouldn't necessarily rely on that. All right, the next ratio I want to go over is our debt to equity ratio. Uh, this is a measure of how well a firm is relying on debt. Uh, and so uh, firms can be financed from two sources. Uh, you use debt, which typically are loans from banks, which we'll get into those more specifically when we talk about capital structures. But debt is essentially a loan. Equity is money that uh, owners invest into your company typically takes the form of stock if co uh, somebody purchases stock in a company they essentially provide you equity so you're getting money from owners because shareholders as we know are considered to be owners uh, with regards to corporations uh, so with the debt to equity ratio we're trying to find out ultimately what is the percentage that a company is financed through debt versus equity Okay. Um, those are the only sources that firms have to actually gain access to funds, either debt, so loans, or equity, either retained earnings, so net income from a prior period that we roll back into the company and reinvest back into the company, or equity, meaning that money that we get from our shareholders. Those are the two sources of funds for major companies. Uh, so with this ratio, it's addressed in a percentage format, and it tells you the percentage of which the company is financed through debt. Typically, you want to see a debt ratio or debt to equity ratio of roughly about 40%. That usually is considered to be somewhat conservative. Um, they're generally all companies utilize debt to some degree, so utilizing debt isn't necessarily a bad thing. But you don't want the debt ratio to get too high because once it gets to the 60% range, uh, then obviously the payments that companies are making on an ongoing basis or monthly basis are very frequent and very high. And then you're also paying interest uh, 
on those as well, which is just requiring you to commit more financial resources, which you could be using in order to pay for other projects or pay for other expenses. And so that's what finance helps you do. It helps you determine, should we finance this through debt? Should we finance this through equity? What are the long-term effects? What would be better for us based upon our position at this point in time? All right, the next ratio I wanna get into is a profitability ratio, and this is our return on equity. And this simply is just trying to tell, to tell you how well is a firm generating returns on the equity it's provided? What kind of return does it generate for investors? That's a great thing to look at because you can tell instantaneously over how well a company is utilizing the equity it's given in order to make profits, of course. Uh, and a very simple way to calculate that is simply to take the net income and divide it by the average common stocks equity, which you can find, of course, on your balance sheet. You factor out preferred dividends from net income. Some companies don't have preferred dividends, so it will not even play a factor. But if you do, you factor those particular things out since they're different from regular common stock, of course. Uh, and so that just simply tells you how well a company is generating profit based upon the resources that are invested from owners or shareholders of a company. It's a great thing to look at because you can tell ultimately how well a company manages equity and how well it does at pr producing profit from the equity that was invested. All right, last thing I will give you is the earnings per share ratio. Uh, earnings per share ratio is a profitability ratio and simply what it does is addressed in a dollar format per share. And so if you see a earnings per share ratio of 10, that means the company generates $10 in earnings for every share uh, that someone holds. And so very simply, you take your net income once again, factor out preferred dividends if the company has preferred dividends, and you divide that by the number of shares that are outstanding at any point in time. And you can find this simply by looking through Google Finance, Yahoo Finance, the number is readily available, both net income and the number of shares outstanding are readily available. And so once again, what this gives you, uh, most importantly, is it tells you how much the firm can generate in terms of profit based upon a sure per, or per share basis. And so the higher a company or the greater earnings per share, uh, the more you can say that a company is better at generating earnings based upon every share of the company. And so that I may look at a company and say, well, this company generates $2 uh, per share in earnings. And this company generates $10 in earnings per share. Obviously, a company with a higher EPS, as it's called, or earnings per share, would be more attractive from an investor. But once again, you do want to make sure that you're comparing two companies that are in the same industry uh, because certain industries have higher earnings per share ratios than others. And so if you're comparing a company that's in the tech industry or tech sector versus one that maybe is in consumer goods, they're gonna be very, very different in terms of the earnings per share ratio that's considered to be good or bad. And so make sure that you're comparing those with companies that are in the same market, in the same industry, and then also comparing those with the industry averages as well. So what are some different tools that financial managers utilize in order to make decisions with regards to how to utilize financial resources? Uh, there's a couple of different budgets, if you will, that allow managers to project and try to account for what costs are going to be so they can make decisions and try and plan accordingly. Uh, and these are statements that we've been over before, but they're just utilized on a budgetary basis, meaning that we're making projections and trying to determine ultimately what we're going to need. Uh, as you know, before you go into a, a bank or anyone asking for funds, uh, you usually have to have some type of uh, projections in terms of, well, what is this project going to cost? Uh, ultimately, how much money am I going to need? And you have to go through those steps in order to make an accurate assessment of what you're going to ask for, but also what are your options in terms of getting those resources as well. So the first thing that's produced is a budgeted income statement. Uh, we're simply going to forecast sales, forecast expenses, forecast net income. Uh, second thing is a budgeted balance sheet. Uh, and this, we're simply going to forecast the different types of assets 
that a company is going to need to carry out its particular plans. We're trying to make projections over what kind of equipment we're going to need. If we're going to need to uh, ha acquire additional inventories, if we're going to need to acquire land for the purpose of building different plants and different operations, those are things that you have to do because your budgeted balance sheet is going to play into ultimately what type of resources or what type of funding you're going to try and seek. And next is the cash budget. Cash budget is very, very important because you want to know if you're going to have as much or have money on hand to pay for expenses for the next month. Just as many of us, we go through a budgetary process to where we project, okay, this is how much money I'm going to bring in next month. These are my expenses. This is how much money I should have or hopefully not, but possibility, this is how much money I need in order to cover those expenses because my income isn't enough to substantiate them. What are some things that I need to do? Do I need to take out a, a quick loan, a short-term loan or a personal loan? Or do I need to ask money or get money from family or friends to bridge that gap? Same thing, obviously, but a different scale, uh, companies and businesses use in order to make those types of decisions. They determine how much money we have coming in. So if I need to take out a line of credit with a bank in order to bridge a gap so I can pay my employees, well, I certainly can do that as a way of continuing to operate. But if a cash, cash budget is not prepared, it's going to put the company in a very, very difficult financial position because you have no idea what are the things that are becoming due the next month the next quarter and the next year because you want to plan for those expenses so you don't put your company in a position to be evaluated negatively by one of these credit rating agencies like SMP or Moody's or Fitch and if you're downgraded your credit is downgraded similar to if your credit score goes lower it now costs you more to gain access to debt financing So what are some of the different funding options? What do companies have at their disposal in order to gain access to different funds? We're going to discuss what are some of those options in just a few moments here. But before we get to that, there are some things that financial managers need to think about before they determine what funding option they want to pursue. Uh, one of the things they need to look at really is what is the firm stage of development? Are they a growing company? Are they a startup? Are they a mature company? And those have a lot of implications, especially now. Startups will have a more difficult time getting access to funds unless they can gain venture capital money. Uh, because they don't have access to the same funding sources as mature companies do who have been operating for an extended period of time, who have the sales to support access to the loan, who have the continuity and the track record for being successful. Startup companies or very young companies don't have that. And so that the stage of development ultimately has to be considered because it's going to give you access to different opportunities that maybe wouldn't be available. You also have to ask yourself, what's the purpose for using these funds? Are we are we trying to bridge a gap that's very short term? Do I did I conduct a cash budget or projected cash budget? And I realize that I'm, you know, negative ten thousand dollars for the month of December, and now I have to gain access to just short-term funding for a brief period of time. That's going to look very different than if you need some type of major investment to support building a new plant or acquiring expensive equipment. You know, maybe you just have a line of credit with a bank, very short-term, might be a higher interest rate, but it's only for a short period of time. But if you're looking at major investments, things that are more long term, well, you're going to look at different funding sources that don't require you to pay them back, at least in the very, very short term. Well, one of the things that comes up with regards to financing are the two different types of financing. And those are equity financing as well as debt financing. And we've gone over these before, but we really haven't put a name on what they are. Uh, and these two types of financing comprise what's known as a capital structure of a company. And I'll explain what that is. Uh, but first, let's talk about equity financing. Equity financing is money that's acquired from owners of a company. And so when we're referring to publicly traded companies, we're referring to shareholders, people that purchase stock in a company. And so if you purchase stock, you're exchanging money that is going to the company in exchange you are actually receiving a certificate, not really a tangible certificate, but an electronic certificate that's giving you certain rights. 
It rights to a claim on assets if there's any available after creditors have been paid, but also a right to potentially dividends, voting rights, and some other things as well. Uh, and so equity financing is money acquired from shareholders. Uh, it also includes retained earnings, uh, which we, when we discussed accounting, we talked about net income, which is the bottom of the income statement, the profit of a company. And if a company decides to take that profit or net income and reinvest it back in the company in some way, we refer to that as retained earnings, earnings being retained for future use. So that would also be an example of equity financing. The other end, we have debt financing which is money acquired from non-owners, uh, most notably takes the form of lenders, financial institutions, commercial banks, that lend money to different companies, different businesses, that obviously have to get repaid back. There is a interest associated with that as well, which has to be considered, and we'll talk more about that once we get into the advantages and the disadvantages of the different types of financing. Uh, and so these two forms comprise what we call the capital structure. And so if I say a firm's capital structure is 60-40, uh, what that could mean is that a company's financed with 60% debt versus 40% equity. Or if it's 40-60, that tells you the company is financed through 40% equity versus 60%. And so you can kind of see how this plays a factor here and plays a role. Uh, and the reason it's important, of course, is from an investor standpoint, I can determine how much a company has in terms of uh, ownership spread out among different investors or how leveraged a company is with debt and companies utilize both equity as well as debt financing to varying degrees and how they do so basically comprises what their capital structure is so what are the some of the different advantages and dis disadvantages the pros and cons associated with we'll start with debt financing and then we'll move on to equity financing the first thing with debt financing is that interest payments are tax deductible. Uh, much like a mortgage payment is for a house, you can deduct, you can deduct the, uh, the payment that you actually make on that particular uh, asset, if you will. Uh, that's obviously tax deductible. Uh, same thing like interest payments are for different businesses. So that certainly provides an advantage because that obviously reduces taxable income, uh, which is beneficial as we know. It also avoids diluting ownership. Uh, when you're issuing shares on the open market, what you're essentially doing is you're slicing your company up into smaller pieces. If you agree to sell 25% stake in your company, you're taking 25%, you're dividing it up amongst maybe thousands if not millions of shares, and you're selling that uh, on a per share basis to investors. And so you're giving up partial ownership of your company. Uh, and so the more and more times that you do that, you go through an IPO you go through a secondary offering, which we'll talk about next week. You're essentially diluting the ownership of existing owners. So if I, let's say for example, if I own 5% of McDonald's, uh, which would be a, a significant stake, especially when you consider how many shares there are at standing, and you consider what the share price is just for one share of McDonald's stock. But let's say I own 5%. Let's say that McDonald's does a secondary offering where they decide, you know what, we're gonna, we want to get access to more funding, we need more resources, so we're going to go ahead and do a secondary offering in the market. Uh, we're going to issue another 10 million shares. Okay? What that does is, as an existing investor, an ex existing owner, that dilutes my ownership because now there's more shares out there in the market that they originally were before. So instead of owning maybe a 5% stake, maybe now I own four and a half or even four. And you may think, well, that's not really a big deal, but it does play a big role, especially when you consider that each share grants you voting rights. So instead of being a 5%, having a 5% stake in the company, meaning I con control 5% of the votes, I now control four and a half. I now control four. And so what that does is that forces existing shareholders to purchase more shares as a way of maintaining that existing percentage of ownership that they originally had, which can certainly turn off certain investors. Another advantage with debt financing is you avoid having to publicly disclose of your financial statements. You're only working with a particular institution or commercial bank, and so they obviously need to see your financials, but no one else, the public, doesn't necessarily need to. So if you're trying to operate uh, fairly in a fairly secretive manner, then this might be a, a form of funding that could be appealing to you.
Now, debt financing also comes with several disadvantages, several cons. Uh, first of which is it's legally binding. Uh, it is a requirement to repay. And so you have to, of course, make fixed payments. Uh, but this this only way this would go away is if you tried to become if you became insolvent, essentially stated you file for bankruptcy essentially for a company you could not pay and then the courts have to work out some type of arrangement for you to possibly be able to repay a percentage of the creditors. But for all intents and purposes, it is legally binding, so it is requirement you do have to pay them back. Of course, it also requires fixed payments. And so usually with debt financing, you're going to make monthly payments on that debt, much as you and I would if we had a credit card loan outstanding, if we had a particular uh, be a car loan or a mortgage, we're making monthly payments on that as well. And so that requires fixed payments. Uh, also requires interest payments to be made because we have to continue to make uh, pay, make interest payments as a way of compensating that financial institution for lending us that money because they're giving up the right to use that money for other things. So it's only fair that we compensate them as a result of them not having the money at least initially. Uh, the next thing that may be required is a lot of lenders do require collateral, uh, which are assets that you put up to actually fund the loan so that in the event that you cannot pay back that particular loan, they can seize that particular asset, whether it be a car, a house, a piece of equipment, maybe even stocks or something similar. So that you have the ability to take that and then sell that so that you can recover the money that you are owed. Uh, many lenders do require that and obviously that would be a disadvantage. Next, there are limitations on the amount of money that you can raise through debt financing. You know, if you're trying to raise 10, 20 billion dollars, it's going to be very difficult to do that from an actual financial institution because most banks don't have that kind of money on hand simply to write a check and give you that. Uh, so certainly you can raise financing, but you can't raise significant amounts of financing as you could through equity financing. All right, now let's take a look at equity financing. Uh, equity financing certainly has its advantages and disadvantages, very similarly to debt financing, of course. Uh, but there are a couple things specifically that it allows you to do uh, which are beneficial over debt financing. Uh, the first of which is you have a little bit more flexibility. Now, the reason you have more flexibility is with debt financing, it's typically going towards a certain project. With equity financing, the money is more at your disposal to use what you wish. Now obviously investors are going to want to make sure that you're using it responsibly. Uh, so that doesn't mean you can go you know, blow it on a, a weekend trip to Vegas or something the equivalent. Uh, but you do have a little bit more flexibility than if you were to go through a traditional round of debt financing where you have to prove what you're using it for, where it's going towards specifically. There also is less risk associated with debt financing. The more debt you incur, much like consumers, uh, the greater inability you have to actually meet those ongoing debt payments. And also the riskier that you are viewed in the eyes of the investor and the investment community. Very similar to how some countries with very high debts are viewed as risky, like Spain, uh, like Greece, uh, companies will be viewed in the same light. The other advantage is it doesn't require you to make monthly payments. Uh, debt financing, of course, requires the monthly ongoing payments as well as interest on top of that. And you don't necessarily have to do that with equity financing because you're exchanging a percentage of ownership in exchange for resources so you can fund different projects and do different things. And so there's no promise of repayment here, which makes equity financing a little more risky on the investor side. But from an investor standpoint, the reason why I would invest in a company is to hopefully that company makes strong financial decisions and then ultimately it could appreciate in value, which in turn benefits me if I were to sell it for more than I actually acquired the stock at. Now equity financing isn't necessarily uh, void of any disadvantages. Uh, the primary disadvantage, of course, is that the dilution of ownership takes place. And this can certainly cause some disgruntled investors if a secondary round of financing is issued and that dilutes the ownership of existing shareholders. So certainly something to keep in mind. There also is no tax benefit, of course. Uh, debt financing, you can, of course, write off the payments and interest payments that you make. Can't necessarily do that with equity financing. And you also forego the ability to use financial leverage. Uh, financial leverage is not necessarily a bad thing. We talk about leverage meaning debt. And it isn't necessarily bad, although many people have a negative perception of debt. And we've seen 
how bad, if debt is accumulated to a great degree, what the effect could be. Uh, but debt could be utilized in a fairly conservative manner. Uh, but obviously, once it's accumulated to where it's so extensive, to where a lot of your resources are going to actually pay off that debt and the interest payments that are subsequent to it, then it puts you in a bad financial position. But debt allows you to use or leverage allows you to turn small gains into larger gains. So instead of having the cash on hand to purchase $100,000 worth of something, well, maybe I can actually get a loan that funds you know, 90000 of that, and I only have to put forth 10000 And so that allows me more cash to use for different things. So briefly, let's discuss managing cash and cash equivalents. Uh, cash we know, obviously we know what that is. A cash equivalent is something that is essentially like cash or be, can be converted to cash fairly easily. And it needs to be managed fairly successfully uh, for the most part. Uh, so obviously companies need cash for a number of different reasons. Obviously we're going to try and pay workers. We're going to try and pay suppliers, creditors. We have to pay taxes. Uh, and many companies, especially in the climate that we're in now, will hold cash uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty in the markets now. Apple has roughly about $110 billion in cash, at least the last time I checked, which is more than any other company. It's more than a lot of companies are actually worth for that matter. And that allows Apple to weather the storm if there are some turbulent times ahead. If there are issues where Apple cannot sell certain products or has to pay for an expensive lawsuit, it certainly has the cash on hand to ultimately make that decision. Now, the trade-off, though, is that cash doesn't earn you any money. And if you have a lot of cash sitting in a very, very safe account, like a money market account or a savings account, it's generally not going to have a significant return. And so stockholders, although they agree that certain amounts of cash should be maintained, they want to know why cash is invested in a very, very low returning asset. Because remember, financial management, the purpose is to provide the most value. And so I, as an investor, don't view that as providing a great deal of value if we have $110 billion sitting in different money market accounts and different accounts that are earning you know, a quarter of a percent or maybe even less. Uh, so although some cash needs to be maintained, there's a fine balance there. Apple, more specifically, took a lot of criticism over the way it was utilizing cash. As I mentioned before, they had at one point $110 billion in cash. And so many investors were critical over Apple not using that towards different things. And so one of the things that happened as a result of that is Apple announced it was going to be paying a quarterly dividend of roughly about $2.65 per share. So if you hold a share of stock every month or every quarter, you would receive $2.65 for Apple. And then it was also going to commit $10 billion to repurchase existing shares, which we talked about diluting ownership. This does the exact opposite. It makes that you actually own a greater percentage of the company and that the shares that you own actually appreciate in value. So one of the things that came out of there as well. All right, next thing important for companies is being able to manage accounts receivable. Uh, accounts receivable, of course, are money that is owed to a company uh, that it actually provides on credit. Uh, and so many companies do business uh, on on a, a, a creditary or credit basis. So you're not expecting cash payments up front, but you're simply exchanging the goods or services that you provide with the expectation that you're going to get paid 30 to 60 days in the future. So the quicker that a company can convert those accounts receivable into cash, the more favorable it's going to be from a financial standpoint. Because remember, the promise to pay is not the same thing as having cash on hand. I can't do anything with a promise. And so what companies try to do is they try to manage accounts receivable so that they can turn those into cash as quickly as possible so they can actually do things with it. So what are some things that they can do? Well, first is you can set credit terms and establish different credit standards. Many companies offer discounts if a other company repays or pays their particular balance off within 10 days. Uh, usually they apply a 2% discount, which you may think may not be very significant. That's $2 for every $100 that are essentially loaned out. But when you're talking about thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, 2% certainly adds up and it can be very significant. So by allowing discounts and rewarding people for paying early, uh, that serves to get 
those accounts receivable to where people are paying from 30 days to maybe now they pay in five or seven, which is great because I don't have the money in hand, so I can't do anything with it unless they pay me. Uh, credit standards are also important. Obviously, having standards to which you only loan money to people that have the ability to repay you, typically showing that they have obviously good incomes, uh, obviously past track records for repayment. Those are very, very important. And then also designing an appropriate collection policy as well. After certain periods of time, once the account goes to where it's 90 days, 120 days, and someone hasn't get, hasn't paid yet, uh, usually the company assumes that they're not going to collect on that. And so usually what happens is a lot of companies will sell those accounts to a kind of a collection agency or a debt collection company. And usually they're selling them for pennies on the dollar, maybe 30 cents on the dollar. Uh, but at least they can recover something and then it's up to the, co the credit collection agency or the debt collection agency to then go after the individual party as a way of getting access to, to that money that they, they spent. Companies also need to worry about managing inventories. This is extremely important. Uh, inventories can be a number of different things. Uh, includes finished goods, so goods that are completed, work in process, meaning that goods that are in the process of being completed. And so if you have a company that assembles furniture and you have tables with two legs on them, uh, obviously it's not a finished good, so it's considered to be a work in process. And then you also have different parts and materials and different things as well. Uh, but materials or inventory more specifically needs to be managed successfully because there is a trade-off that companies have. On one end, you don't necessarily want customers to be disappointed in your ability to manage inventory when they go to your store and realize you do not have the product that they actually want. And so you don't necessarily want that because then companies are going to a competitor and purchasing the same thing. And usually what happens is when we have a good experience somewhere, then we're more likely to go back there for future purchases. So not only do you run the risk of losing customers in the immediate term, but you also have the risk of alienated customers in the long term as well. But you have to balance that because you don't want to acquire a lot of inventory, especially if it's not going to be purchased, because that represents money. And there is no thing worse than sitting and looking at inventory that just sits there because it just represents money that is literally eroding in front of your eyes. Not only do you have to spend money to acquire it, but you also have to spend money to actually store it. Employees handle it and move it from point A to point B, which increases the likelihood that it actually getting damaged. You have to insure it. So if somebody breaks into a warehouse that you own and it gets stolen, it's insured. But that obviously takes money. And so... Companies have to find a, a fine balance between maintaining low levels of inventory so they're not committing their cash and different resources to something that's just sitting there. Uh, but also they want to make sure to, that they can serve the needs of consumers by offering products that are going to be available and making sure that they're available when consumers come in. Another issue that comes into play with inventory is especially with technological products and tech stuff is that you don't want to hold it for too long or acquire too much of it because something new comes out and all of a sudden that product is obsolete, which makes it so that no one wants to actually buy it. It's very difficult to sell, which is why you see that products typically will decrease in price when something new comes out because people don't want it as much as they do the newer, shinier, brighter product with more features. And so companies need to aggressively manage their inventories, not only for the sake of reducing costs, but also improving their ability to meet demands in the market as well. Well, the last topic that we're going to discuss is capital budgeting. And capital budgeting is, is very, very important here. And what this really deals with is a evaluation of some of the major long-term capital investment opportunities. Now, these are not things that are going to be done short term. You know, we're talking not we're not talking about months, we're typically talking multiple, multiple years. And there's a lot of planning that goes into how to make sure that we have the resources and the finances in place to support these operations. But not only that, is this project, whatever it might be, what is the potential payoff of this project? 
you know, companies don't do things just for the sake of doing them. They want to invest in equipment, invest in land, invest in operations that are going to provide some type of payoff. And so typically what you'll accumulate or what you'll determine is, you know, what is the length of time that we need to actually essentially justify this significant cost. And the shorter term that is, the more likely a company would invest in that particular capital project. Uh, but that's simply what capital budgeting is, is we're trying to evaluate what we're going to be doing in terms of our long-term projects, what are the opportunities that we have on the table, ultimately what is going to provide us the most bang for our buck, and where do we want to spend our resources but also our time. And so what are things that we look at? Well, one of the things that you look at is replacing or purchasing new machines or equipment. You know, obviously equipment has a certain shelf life. We talked about depreciation when we discussed accounting. And so there's a certain number of years that certain projects could be used. And we have to have a plan in place for ultimately when those machines are going to be replaced or when those equipment, that equipment is going to be replaced as well. Uh, so that ultimately we don't have our employees using obsolete equipment that is running very slowly, it's very poor, and it's affecting productivity. Uh, you're also looking at opening or buying new plants. You know, we refer referenced at the beginning of the lecture uh, how the uh, Jerry Jones, who's the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, they engage in a capital budgeting process for that new stadium that they have. You know, that's a very, very long-term project, committed a billion dollars to it. And so they had to go through the steps to make sure, is this something that is going to pay off? If so, what is the time frame before we're actually making money on this particular project? You also look at this as a way of expanding production for growth. At some point in time, companies get to the point to where they need to expand as a way of continuing to grow. They can only serve a certain consumer base, a certain population with existing resources. And there comes a time where they have to gain access to additional funds. They have to have additional plants. They have to have additional equipment as a way of meeting the demand, as a way of growing. And capital budgeting is the process that those financial managers would go through as a way of answering those questions, right? Delineating between a number of different alternatives and determining ultimately what is going to be the best, best bang for our buck. What's the most likely to exceed or succeed, I should say, in the long run? Um, here we have examples of capital budgeting projects, equipment, bulldozers, obviously. Uh, this image on the right that you're probably looking at wondering, what is this? Is this some type of spaceship? Uh, is it actually the newly, uh, not designed, but budgeted for project that Apple is going to be doing for their new headquarters? Uh, and so this just got approved fairly recently within the last few years uh, with the actual uh, city of, I believe it's Cupertino. Uh, so they acquired the land, uh, got approval for the designs and the schematics and different things and are going to start actually building uh, this particular headquarters. It was one of the last capital budgeting projects that Steve Jobs was involved in before he passed away in October of 2011. And so just a few examples of some of the things that companies look at when they're trying to budget for how to spend their money. All right, the last thing we're going to end on is how to evaluate capital budgeting proposals. I am not going to go to it a significant amount of detail. I just want you to understand the general overview themes here. Um, there are specific equations that you actually utilize in order to determine things like the present value, things like a net present value, of course. And I struggled with wanting to explain those things because they're fairly interesting, at least I think so, which, which may be a fault on my part. Um, but also wanting to limit the information I give you because I don't want it to be overwhelming and this is kind of an introduction to a lot of the different functions and so I don't want to be overly specific uh, for that very reason. If you were to take a class in financial management, then obviously you would go into the different finance equations and different things on how to evaluate capital budget projects, but we won't do that for our time here. So when evaluating, the first thing that we're looking at is ultimately uh, the costs and benefits over a project, uh, over an extended period of time. So we're trying to determine ultimately what's the expense, what are the benefits I am going to receive, and ultimately how many years is this going to take for ultimately we can actually pay this thing off because there's a lot of upfront costs associated with capital budgeting projects. And you want to make sure that the project is going to be successful long term, meaning that it's going to provide you revenues to cover those costs ultimately. So one of the most important concepts in finance that you will ever hear is this concept of the time value of money. And this concept very basically is that a dollar received is worth more 
than a dollar received in the future. Okay? So for example, if I were to ask you for a loan, I say, you know what, can I borrow $500? And you say yes. And I say, you know what, I'll agree to pay you back $500 six months from now. So I'm, I'm making you whole, it's the same dollar amount. Okay? So if you were looking at it just from a quantitative dollar standpoint, you would think, okay, I'm getting my money back, it's fine. But according to the time value of money, that $500 six months from now is not worth the same as $500 today. And that's the reason why we usually have to be compensated for not having money. When you put your money in a certificate of deposit or a CD and you agree not to touch it for 12 months, that bank typically will pay you a little higher interest rate because you're agreeing not to use those funds. And when you get access to that money in 12 months, it's not worth the same. For one, you have inflation. Inflation typically runs about 2% every year. Um, that's ideal, but it sometimes runs higher. And so what that means is it now costs you 2% more to purchase various products and services. So although from a monetary standpoint, you have the same dollar amount, in your hands. What you can do with that is less. And so that's why people have to be compensated the longer that they're agreeing not to touch their money. If you agree not to uh, hold your money for 30 years and you're going to invest in a 30-year treasury bond, you would want to make sure that you're going to be compensated for inflation. Otherwise, that money will be worth less, maybe not from a monetary number standpoint, but in terms of what you can do with that money, it will be worth less. Another reason for the time value of money is we have, uh, we don't have the ability to use those funds. And so if I commit a certain number of, uh, of resources, financial resources, money, for 12 months, I'm giving up everything that I can do with that $1,000 for a 12-month period, whether that's investing in another company whether that's purchasing a new computer, really anything at all that you give up, it represents an opportunity cost. And that opportunity cost is the next best thing that you could have put that money towards. But now you have to forego that because you're investing it in a certificate of deposit or something else. Uh, and so we need to be very careful with the time value of money uh, because ultimately you want to make sure that your money is going to be worth uh, more than it is right now if you're not going to touch it for a certain period of time. Now one of the ways that you do that is determining uh, present and future values. And there's an equation that you utilize to determine this, fairly basic. I'm not going to go over it today. I may record a subsequent uh, video at some point in time with the quantitative kind of calculations on how you would do that, but I'm not going to do that for the time being. Uh, but the present value is how much uh, amount of cash would you receive in the future? Uh, what is it worth in today's dollars? So if I said, you know what? If you give me $1,000 now, in six months, I'm going to give you $1,100. Okay? How do you know if that's good? It's higher. So you might think, yeah, that's better. $100 in six months, that's pretty good work. But you don't know yet until you determine what the present value in today's dollars of $1,100 is. And so typically what that requires you to do is determine what's the interest rate I can actually get on this investment, right? What's a, what's a safe interest rate, maybe a savings account that I could obtain, okay? And what is my the time period? So we're talking six months, usually you're compounding interest. And so you're trying to determine, is that $1,100, is that worth more than $1,000 today? If it is, then it'd be a good decision. If $1,100 in today's dollars is worth $900, then that may not be a very, very good decision because you're giving $9,000 or $1,000 and you're essentially getting $900 back in today's dollars. But you understand how because it's a higher amount, we often think, oh, that's a good investment. But you have to compare it to today's dollars, not six months from now. Uh, you can also do the opposite. You can determine the future value of an investment. So you essentially take a, a lump sum, say $10,000 and you invest it for a certain interest rate for a certain number of years and you can calculate what that investment will be worth in the future. That's certainly another thing that you can do as well. Uh, and so usually when companies evaluate projects, there's a number of different things they can do. One of the most common ones is to determine what we call the net present value. Uh, and that is the present value of all of the cash flows associated with an investment. So say we have cash flows in years two, three, four, and five and they're $500. 
Well, obviously, in today's money, they're not worth $500. They're worth less. And so essentially what we do is we go through a process of discounting those cash flows to make them the equivalent of what they would be worth today. Uh, and so that determines, ultimately, if it's an actual worthy investment. Uh, if the money that we're investing is less than the money that we're expected to receive in today's dollars, if it's positive, then that might mean that this is actually a good investment. We can at least make some money off of this investment. If it's negative, then that usually means that that investment won't pay off at least in the time period that you're thinking. And so those are some things that you can do to evaluate whether or not a capital budgeting project or proposal is really worth the time and effort to go through with it. Is there going to be a return at least in some period of time? All right, well, that concludes our discussion, kind of the introduction to finance. Uh, as I mentioned before, I tried to keep things fairly basic, fairly general, uh, not going into too many details regarding financial ratios or the different capital budgeting uh, finances, future value, present value, net present value. Uh, try to keep them more of an overview introduction, if you will. Uh, if there are questions, please do let me know. Otherwise, thank you for joining. Have a great week.